Madam President, I rise tonight to talk about the Medicaid program, and in particular, a, a news story that, that um, came to our attention this past weekend. This is the, the headline. Um, this is from a story dated um, the 11th of January, uh, late in the day, and it's by the Hill newspaper. I, I, you won't be able to see it from a distance, but the headline reads, Trump officials consider allowing Medicaid block grants for states. Trump officials considering or consider allowing Medicaid block grants for states. Here's what just the first uh, uh, two short paragraphs uh, outline. The story begins as follows. The Trump administration is considering moving forward with a major conservative change to Medicaid by allowing states to get block grants for the program, sources say. Capping the amount of money that the federal government spends on the health insurance program for the poor through a block grant has long been a conservative goal. It was, con it was a controversial part of the Obamacare repeal debate in 2017, with much of the public rallying against cuts to Medicaid. After the failure of that repeal effort, the Trump administration is now considering issuing guidance to states, encouraging them to apply for caps on federal Medicaid spending in exchange for additional flexibility on how they run the program, according to people familiar with the discussions." End quote. I won't read the rest of the story, and I won't enter the whole story into the record because uh, folks can look it up. And there are other stories as well that covered this same news. So in a, in a sense, it's a big new development, but it's an old story. It's an old story of members of Congress and uh, the administration uh, coming together to try to uh, make changes to the Medicaid program. In this case, it differs only slightly in that, so far at least, this seems to be um, an initiative that's an administration-led initiative. Uh, we, we're not aware of any, uh, as far as I know, any congressional involvement. But it's not all that much different, right? It's the same thing. We had a long debate in 2017 about whether we should not only repeal the Affordable Care Act, but thereby do two things to Medicaid. One is to end, over time, Medicaid expansion. And second would be to have cuts to Medicaid that would result from this same idea, so-called block granting uh, of Medicaid. I believe that we litigated, if we can use that word in a legislative sense, litigated that in 2017. The um, repeal bill did not pass the Senate in the summer of 2017. There were other attempts that didn't come to a vote on, on full repeal. Then we had an election in 2018. Health care was a major part of that debate, most of it centering on protections for pre-existing conditions and other consumer protections in the law. But if you look at the last two years, where you had one party rule in Washington, Republican President, Republican House, Republican Senate, uh, there were major efforts by the administration, by both houses of Congress, majorities in both houses in Congress, to make substantial changes to Medicaid, and it did not happen. So failing all those attempts, now the administration, I would assume trying to do it secretively, but, but now exposed, um, wants to make changes to Medicaid by way of granting waivers and inviting states to, uh, to in essence, uh, change Medicaid at the state level. Now, this, this um, initiative will not affect Pennsylvania, uh, or it's highly unlikely to affect Pennsylvania in the near term. So this is about uh, major parts of the country, but not every state. But it's a bad idea uh, in short order. Because what this block granting means is 
uh, benefits get cut. Because it's very simple. When you cut a program that's focused on health care for low-income children, uh, health care coverage for those with disabilities, children and adults, and helping seniors have the benefit of skilled care in a nursing home, that's another benefit of Medicaid. You're talking about benefits being cut over time, maybe more cuts in one state versus the other, depending upon the nature of the waiver and the particulars of the program in that state, but it's cutting, it's gonna be cutting uh, Medicaid. It's a bad idea, and I think the American people understand that, especially after uh, the debate in 2017. Maybe there were some folks who didn't really appreciate Medicaid, probably a lot of them in Washington didn't appreciate Medicaid before the 2017 debates in 2018. Maybe there were folks who weren't paying attention for a lot of years, didn't realize the scope of Medicaid, didn't realize it covers 70 million Americans. And I know that's why some Republican elected officials in the Congress are hostile to it, uh, very hostile to it because they think it covers too many people. Um, but I think after 2017, those who were misinformed or had forgotten or were, just were never aware of the, of the benefits of Medicaid got a real good reminder because of the debate we had. So that was one positive outgrowth of that, that long and, and difficult debate on health care generally, Affordable Care Act specifically, but also by extension uh, Medicaid. A proposal like this to block grant Medicaid, which was proposed numerous times uh, here in the Congress over, over the last couple of years, um, hurts those basically three groups of Americans hurts kids, hurts people with disabilities, and hurts our seniors. And I think that part of it, maybe people tend to forget that this program helps middle-class families as well. Because if you have a disability, you, your income might be higher than, than, than low income, but you get the benefit of, of Medicaid. A lot of middle-class families have a loved one in a nursing home could not be able to, would not be able to afford that kind of long-term care without the benefit of Medicaid. A lot of those families are middle class. Uh, when it comes to children, of course, uh, that's for low, children from low-income families, but those children are getting what many believe to be the, the gold standard for children's uh, health care. I like to say that in, in Pennsylvania, Medicaid is a 40, 50, 60 program. 40, 50, 60, real simple. 40% of the, the kids in our state, uh, ha thankfully, have the benefit of Medicaid. 50% of people with disabilities, roughly, about half of the people in our state with disabilities get the benefit of Medicaid. Thank goodness they do. And thirdly, the 60, 60% 60 of people getting long-term care in, in Pennsylvania could not get it without the benefit of Medicaid. Now, in some states, the percentages might be higher or lower than that. But when you have a program that covers 40% of your children, 50% of your population that has a disability, and 60% of your seniors could get long-term care, which they need, <laughs> they have to, those folks who have long-term care need it and have to have it, when you have that kind of a program that covers roughly 2 million people in Pennsylvania, 70 million nationwide, you're going to get the attention of a lot of people when, you, when you're messing with it. That's a technical term, messing with it. By, by saying, in some, to some degree under the cover of darkness, not having a debate on the floor of the House or the Senate, but by sending, mess, you know, sending guidance, quote, guidance to states, inviting them to apply for a waiver and takes a while to approve the waiver and all of a sudden it comes out that the waiver is granted and guess what your state if you're if you're a, if you live in a state where that happens and you're on medicaid you might not have medicaid a year from the waiver being granted or two years or five years at some point you may be adversely affected by that so this is very serious business when it comes to those 
very vulnerable Americans. And in so many ways, Medicaid, like a lot of things we debate here, not only Medicaid, but I think Medicaid is one of, of many examples we could cite, but Medicaid, Medicaid tells us who we are as a nation, right? Uh, people around the world don't simply respect America because America has a, uh, a strong military, the strongest, best military, the best fighting men and women uh, in the world. No one's even close. But there are a lot of nations that have spent a lot of their military and have, have strong fighting men and women, have, strong, have a strong military, and they're not respected like we are. But thank God we have a strong military. We have the strongest economy in the world. We're, we, we're blessed by that. But one of the other ways that the world respects us is be, because they, they often conclude that we treat our own people better than some other places. And Medicaid, which is a 50-year-old program, is a program that tells us who we are as a nation, whom we value, and whom we're willing to fight on behalf of. Tells us a lot about who we are. So America is great because we, we care deeply about those 70 million people that get the benefit of that program, just like we care deeply about other Americans who benefit or have a connection to our government. And before any administration or any part of our government takes an action that will lead to the cutting back of, of a program like Medicaid, whether it's by way of legislation or by way of waivers or regulation, uh, they need to hear from us. And I, for one, am willing to fight on this a long time. A, a long time. And if I do nothing else but fight this battle, sign me up, because we're going to fight hard. I'm not certain we'll win, but I think, I think we will win this battle. So Medicaid tells us who we are. And why do I say that? Well, because we hear from families all the time. I got a letter at the beginning of the debate in 2017 from a mom, like, like a lot of members of the United States Senate, you get a letter from a mom or a dad or a family member. Sitting down to put pen to paper, in a sense, uh, to write a letter or to send you an email or to express what, is, what their lives will be like without a program, what their lives will be like uh, if a change goes forward. In this case, it was Pam, a mom, talking about her son, Rowan. He's, uh, Rowan is on the autism spectrum, and her mom talks about the process of not just learning that and what that meant to her and to her family and the challenge of it, obviously, but also the benefits that she received because of Medicaid, what we call in Pennsylvania medical assistance, or by the shorthand, MA. I won't read the whole letter, but, but Pam talks about but just one example of what Medicaid means, the wraparound services. All of the, all of the services that a child gets that has, has a disability, either on, maybe on the autism spectrum or a, a physical disability, or maybe a child that, that has Down syndrome. In this case, Rowan is on the autism spectrum. She talks about the behavioral specialist consultant and the therapeutic staff support worker that helps her and the benefits of that, and what that means to, to Pam as a mom and her family, but also what it means to her son, Rowan. She talks about Rowan benefiting, quote, immensely, benefiting immensely from a program called the Child Guidance Resource Center, which recently started a new program at this time called the CREATE program. It's a social skills program specifically for autistic children ages three to 21. And she enrolled Rowan in that program, that so-called CREATE program. She goes on to say, quote, I am thrilled by Rowan's daily progress. I cannot say enough great things about this program, unquote. That program would not be part of the life of that family absent Medicaid. Or that program would not be part of the life of that family in the instance where that family was living in a state 
that have been granted a waiver that allowed block grants that thereby allowed cuts uh, that resulted in that family not getting that kind of service. Thankfully, she's in a state where the Medicaid program is strong and, and will be defended aggressively. But I don't want a Rowan in another state or a Pam, a mom in, in another state, um, not having the benefit that Rowan in Pennsylvania has and that Pam in Pennsylvania has. Pam goes on to say, without medical assistance, our family would be bankrupt or my son would go without the therapies he sincerely needs, unquote. And then at the end of the letter, she concludes by asking me as her representative to think about her family when we're debating these issues. And I'm quoting, please, she talks about her, she and her husband and, and her son Rowan first. And then she says, she concludes the letter this way, quote, please think of my nine month old daughter Luna, who smiles and laughs at her brother daily. She will have to care for Rowan late in her life after we are gone. Overall, we are desperately in need of Rowan's medical assistance and would be devastated if we lost these benefits, unquote. That's what one mom said about the importance of Medicaid to that family. Now, my point in raising this issue, even though, thankfully, that we, now that we've beaten back an effort to legislatively change the Medicaid program for the worse, now we have an administrative effort to undermine the program. But I raise this so, simply to say that that family in America should not have to worry for 10 minutes whether or not their government was gonna continue those important benefits to their son or to their daughter, whatever the case may be. Maybe to their mom in a nursing home or maybe to um, a neighbor who has got a, a son or a daughter because of the income level is getting Medicaid. They shouldn't have to worry for, for 15, 10 or 15 minutes about that. Because you know what, we're America. We made a decision 50 years ago, and it was a good decision to take care of those families and to do everything we could. Some days we won't get it right. Some days we'll make mistakes. But on most days, a program like that is helping lots of families, tens of millions of them. And the bureaucrats or the elected officials or the administration officials in Washington who seek to make changes that will adversely affect even one of those families has to look those families in the eye or should look them in the eye and tell them why that is good, not just for that family. Why is that good for America? How is that going to help us? Oh, and I know what the argument will be. I've heard it over and over again. They say it's unsustainable the program, right? They say, oh, we're not going to be able to afford this much Medicaid 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 25 years from now. Well, when they say unsustainable around here, I want to translate for you. That means they're not willing to make people of means pay for it. So let me say it bluntly. If we have to charge someone else who has a high income to preserve, to preserve Medicaid, sign me up for that too. Let's be very clear about this. This program is that important. And I believe there are a lot of Americans of means, of high incomes, that would want to make sure this program was preserved. I know there's some politicians around here who are always talking about how you've got to make sure that they have low tax rates. But I think a lot of those Americans want to preserve the Medicaid program want to strengthen it, want to make changes that are appropriate, want to make it more efficient where we can. But there are a lot of Americans out there of great means who want this program preserved. So we have a lot of work to do to make sure we move in the right direction. Let me make one or two more final points and I'll conclude. One of the other questions is what happens if a block grant proposal goes through? nationwide, but even in, even in more limited instances. Way back in, in um, November of 2016, one of the many organizations that tracks this kind of a program over time, the Medicaid program or healthcare programs, 
uh, issued a report, and they've issued many of these reports, but here's just one for your consideration. The name of the organization is Center on Budget and Policy Priorities here in Washington. Been around a long time, uh, was very helpful in the debate on health care about the impact of various proposals. Here's what, the, here's what the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities said in November of 2016. The date is November 30, 2016. I won't read the whole report and I won't enter it into the record to save some space. People can look it up, right? But here's the headline, Medicaid block grant would slash federal funding, shift costs to states, and leave millions more uninsured. Here's what some of the headlines say in the report. First one says a block grant would cap federal Medicaid funding in order to achieve savings for the federal government. That's what the, the proposal is, is intended to do. Number two, the likely magnitude of federal funding cuts and resulting cost shift to states would be very large. Number three, such a block grant would push states to cut their Medicaid programs deeply. Uh, the last two are as follows. Medicaid is already efficient and innovative. That's true. We don't talk about that enough. It's true. And the last headline is a Medicaid block grant would thus lead to draconian cuts to eligibility, benefits, and provider payment rates. What they didn't mention there is it would also hurt a lot of hospitals, in the, especially rural hospitals, cuts to Medicaid. But here's the number. The House Republican budget plan for fiscal year 2017, we're going back now to the, the latter part of 2016. Um, here's what the report concludes. Quote, would have cut, this is, this is in the instance of being implemented as law, quote, would have cut federal Medicaid funding by $1 trillion or nearly 25% over 10 years relative to current law on top of the cuts the plan would, would secure by repealing the ACA's Medicaid expansion, unquote. So I realize that number is bigger than what we're talking about here because we're talking about a number of states changing their Medicaid program because of a block granting um, waiver that was granted to that particular state. But I'm not too concerned about the, the, the overall number because that's impossible to predict. But even if just one state was granted this kind of a waiver and, and implemented block grants, a lot of people in that state would lose their, their Medicaid. And I think we should be concerned if it was one person losing Medicaid because of that, let alone thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or, in fact, millions. If, if, if block granting was gr granted for the whole country, you're talking double-figure millions would, would lose that kind of coverage. But even if it's a much smaller number, we should be very concerned about this. Here's another reason not to, to mess around with Medicaid in a way that adversely impacts people or undermines the program. I hear a lot of politicians in Washington, both houses, both parties. And I think in almost every instance, it's probably an exception to this, but in almost every instance are speaking from their heart and, and do truly care about what's happening in their communities and their states because of the opioid crisis. It's everywhere. It's urban. It's rural. It's suburban. It's everywhere. And it's devastating. We've never seen a public health problem like it probably in 100 years, or at least not anything worse than it. So it's a problem in Pennsylvania. It's a problem in every state. I'm sure the presiding officer would agree. But here's the part they don't talk about. Sometimes that same person who says, I really am worried about the, the opioid crisis, and I want to do the following to, to help people who are in the grip of that addiction, and I want to institute a program or provide funding or otherwise. That's wonderful when they have that initiative. But sometimes that same member of Congress in the next breath will say, but I want to block grant Medicaid, or I want to cut, uh, cut, cut or cap Medicaid, or we need to cut back on what we spend on Medicaid. And they vote for budget after budget after budget and bill after bill to cut Medicaid. What do you think is the number one payer when it comes to the the opioid crisis, the primary payer for opioid treatment and recovery. You guessed it, Medicaid. So if you're going to go down this road, 
and talk about this program as if it's some far off program for, for them, for someone else, you should look in the mirror because Medicaid is an us program, not a them program, not a program for someone far away. It's, it's our neighbors, it's our friends. Whether they have an opioid addiction and can only get treatment and services, mostly because of Medicaid expansion actually, than as part of the Affordable Care Act. But Medicaid itself, the core program, of course is a program that makes sure that a child has health care, even if they're low income, and their mom or their dad or their, the person taking care of them is not working, doesn't have employer coverage. They get, they get the benefit of Medicaid. And guess what, when that low income child gets Medicaid, we all benefit. That child's more likely to, to grow up healthier. And he or she will be more productive and a stronger part of our economy. So Medicaid for poor ch low-income children or children from low-income families helps all of us. It doesn't just help that child. It's not just a nice thing to do. It's the right thing to do, but it's also very practical. Medicaid helps people with disabilities, either whether they have a profound disability or otherwise. And they have to be eligible for it based upon their disability. But we've made a decision that that that's a good thing to do for that individual and for society. And the same is true of a, of a you know, people make a decision about a loved one going into long-term care and they spend down their assets. And there's usually a big gap after they spend down. Middle-class families, sometimes people above middle class, spend down and they, they can't afford the cost of nursing home care. And the state says, and the federal government says, we, we, th we want to help you. That's why Medicaid is so critical to nursing homes. And if you look at the, the dollars spent, it would not be entirely inaccurate to say that Medicaid is a nursing home program with help for children and people with disabilities as well. So I'm just putting the administration on notice that if they want to continue to pursue this, we're going to have a big fight about it. And it's a fight that will go on a long time. It'll go on in the courts. It'll go on on this, it'll be, we will litigate it on this floor. We'll litigate, litigate it in committees and fight about it in the House and the Senate. We'll fight in the streets of our states and we'll fight about it a long time until we win. Because we have other things to do to lift people up around here, to do more on healthcare, to lower the cost of health care, lower the cost of prescription drugs, make sure that these programs work well. We don't have time for throwing millions of people off of health care or tens of millions off of health care. But there is a broad bipartisan consensus on a whole range of things we could do on, on health care. That's what we should work on. And the administration, if they're doing the right thing, would abandon these reckless extreme ideas on Medicaid and join us, join both parties in both houses in trying to do something positive and constructive and American on health care. I don't think it's American to say to a child, yeah, you had, you had Medicaid before, but we couldn't afford it. We're, you're not going to have health care any longer. Or to say that to a, someone with a disability or a senior. So if they want to fight, we're, we're going to be ready to fight. And we will punch hard in that fight, figuratively speaking, of course, fighting every minute of every day against us. Madam President, I would yield the floor.